John Murray. M-U-R-R-A-Y. And... You dance? Yes. <laughs> you don't like that? You dance? I dance. Yeah, right. <laughs> like art. Yeah. But... I'll keep track of the time by putting my watch on me. Oh, they've nicely covered the clock? They've nicely covered the clock, yes. Yeah, so. All right, we're going to talk today. I'm John Murray. Hi, John Murray. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk today about three things. Being a chief judge, being a judge, and being a contestant for those who would like to be a contestant in contest. And what judges are looking for. So, we're going to cover quite a bit in about 45, 50 minutes. It's usually broken up into two-hour segments. But one of the things that uh, we did get in the past week are the new rules. Which is kind of interesting because the rules are usually released in the first week before the 1st of January. And they run from January 1st to December 31st, but this year they, re they actually re released them mid-year. Now, we are actually in the middle of the contest season, believe it or not. You think the contests have been over, but no, the international speech contest is still going on. And we'll finish up in August. Fortunately, there are only a very few minor changes. And I'm going to tell you that, what they are. There is a form right before you, like this, and it will tell you what the changes are in the new rule book. And one is just about a charter member, and because the old rule book talked about a charter member being eligible for a contest, if they are a charter member of a chartered club, it had a specific date, but because the specific date is no longer relevant, it was the previous July 1st of the year, it is now less than one year before the club contest is permitted to compete, compete without having completed the requirement of six speeches. So it's now the rule changes as stated right above the top there. There are two other changes and they read they are only for the evaluation and table topics contest. And they state the contestants may not use digital or other devices during the contest to gain an unfair advantage. So for table topics and evaluation only, that's not applying to international humorous, tall tales, or any other. It's just those two. Can you give us an example of what that would mean? Well, for example, digital uh, or contest, uh, digital content or other devices, maybe using a, a, a smartphone that you got on you. Um, it may be that I, I, you know, it's you, you it's were, totally out of context, and this is the only reference it has. But it's hard to tell exactly what they're referring to, but. For evaluation for tabletop contest, you may not use digital or other devices. Certainly, you, you wouldn't want to use a smartphone if you've got it on you. So you maybe ask a question, and all of a sudden you go like this: uh, "What what is my life going to be like in ten years?" Well, I'm telling you, this is what I think my life will be like in ten years. I see, you know, you don't want to use digital or other devices, something like that. I think that's the main purpose because it's something that's more impromptu. Mm -hmm. Or to learn what the table topic is about. Or, yes, possibly yeah. look up some Mind up possible the question things. That everyone's uh, being asked. What? Well, you wouldn't, well, somebody, well, you wouldn't you know the, the well, question in advance. But you could know the question because somebody, somebody who was sitting in the room hearing the competition could text somebody who was sitting in the room. That's a good point. 
That too. That's a good point. So now we need cameras. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the changes that. Uh, one question about the the it sounds like a charter member who joins a week before the club goes into contest. A charter member of a charter club, club. newly chartered club, and to go in a week before the contest yeah. starts and be part of the contest. And. I would love to explain this even more because that's a great point. Because let's say Dan, you're a member of you remember several of those, yeah. and you have only five speeches. Technically, you're not eligible to compete coming from one of those clubs. It's an older club. But let's say you join a newly chartered club, one that had been chartered in the past year, and where it was a charter member. Let's say it had a chartered within a month before the contest. You have only five speeches, two speeches, one speech, zero speech, speeches to your, to your credit. You are, inter, you are now eligible for the international speech contest. Otherwise, if you're from a, an older club, you would have a requirement of a minimum of six speeches. Oh, and a charter member is one of the members of who originated the club. Started the club. Okay, well, so you the can't club. join the club yes. the week before. Yeah, you can't join, you have to be a charter member. Yeah, so there's a charter, there, and there's a charter period, too. <clears throat> so it's not like one day. There's a charter period, and until the car, you can join the club, and until the club actually charters, you're, you can be in that charter membership group. So it may take a month or two for it to charter, but if it you can join it two months and two months and then charters. Once the, the <coughs> charters, you're a charter member. How, the contest begins, the international contest begins one month later. You've completed zero speeches, even though you're a member of other clubs. You are now eligible to compete in an international speech contest where you wouldn't otherwise be a member. That would be eligible. Yeah. And that is something that is uh, I hard to understand. I know one person that was in my club, and he gave a speech, he didn't win. So the next thing I know, he's in the speech contest because he's in another club. Yes. Well, you can do that. You can, right. you can compete <laughs> in as many clubs as you want, but you have to make a choice once you go to the area, because you cannot compete in more than one area contest. But you can compete in, in as many club contest as you want, and then you can choose the club con the club you want to represent to go forward to the area. You have to win. You have to win. Absolutely, you have to win. How many of, yes, Richard? So if you uh, caught a contestant using their digital device, DQ? Absolutely. No, it has to, they have to use it to gain unfair advantage. Yeah. So if they get a call from home, that's not using a digital device to, yeah, for unfair advantage. But you wouldn't be answering a call from home while you were answering a tabletop question or giving an evaluation. Well, no, you're you're waiting for the table topic question in a sequestered oh, area. Oh, yes, you are. You're right. Your phone that. call. Your, yeah, your right. digital device should not be accessible or on or with you at the time for an evaluation for a table topics. When you're off with a sergeant of arms, you right. should be without a digital device. Well, period. As period. period. Correct. Right. I would yeah. not, yeah. As yes. an SAA, I would not be allowing exactly. any digital device. Yeah. Exactly. I, actually, they, they, I don't know if I can share the story, they have, they recommend some cyber alarms, they converse with the contestants before they, before the question, so they, so that, or, or he encourages conversation just so, uh, make sure that they don't do anything like that. Right. Who's here to be a contestant, possibly in a contest? And who's here to be a good? Right up front here. Good, good, good. And who is here with the idea of being a judge? Excellent. And who's here with the idea of being a chief judge? <laughs> One. Very happy. I'm proud of you. You said you raised your hand for a possible chief judge. Well, I'm going to do it. Uh, Boy, when, we, when we hear somebody that says chief, they want to be a chief judge, you're like in red letters, bold. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I am in red, but... 
It's wonderful that you are saying yes, because we need more and more people to create a larger pool of people to draw from, because the judges get tired because they're called upon contest after contest, and we have a limit on the number of times you can be chief judge. It's only two per contest season, so we want to make sure that we get it spread around, we develop new chief judges, and give, get, give everybody an ex a, a chance for a great experience of leadership. Actually, a great job. Actually, qualified chief judge for us. What is that? Qualified chief judge for us. Qualified. I was thinking different. Yes. I, I actually would be a chief judge, but qualified for us. Qual qualified chief judge for you? Well, yeah, to explain. What, what, yeah, well, I'm going to. Okay. I'll, I'll do that now. I'm just kind of setting up things. I want to know what everybody's here for. And I will do that. Before you, <clears throat> I have created two staple, I would call them checklists. What is a checklist? It's one that like this. And that is to help you prepare you for the contest. And this is really for a chief judge. So we'll work from a chief judge down to a judge to a contestant. I have a chief judge checklist. And then I have a chief judge contest script. Because when you're briefing, <clears throat> you need to have a number of things that you want to make sure of points that are important for the people that are judges and contestants to know about, to make sure that everything is checked off. And I'll go through some of those things, but what I have done for this, I've created it in 14 point type, uh, typeset font. And what I like about this is I've broken everything down into one page. So briefing the sergeant at arms. Once I have, as chief judge, I've done briefing of all of the judges, all of the functionaries, contestants, and so forth. I simply give this whole page to the sergeant at arms to take back with them. If they missed anything or misunderstood anything, it's all there for them. I've got the same for the ballot counters, for the timers, etc. And as you go through the timers, and a lot of people that are timers, for example, they get back and while you've told them the timing, they may forget or they want to have a, a check. The other thing is that when we come into the fall, fall contest, we have the evaluation contest. We have a <clears throat> test speaker. Dan Higgins, for example, has been a test speaker in a contest. And even though the timers were briefed about <coughs> timing the test speaker, he was not timed. So we make sure that we put in here that the test speaker is also timed. And the timing for the test speaker. <coughs> and that's to make sure that everybody understands their functions and has an ability to review that when they get back to the timing table or wherever they are during the course of the contest, they know what they need to do. Before the contest, the most important job of a chief judge is to select judges. And you really need to, you have to go through the list of trained, probably trained judges that would like to participate. We have a list on file with District 52, about 170 names of people who have been trained and said they're willing to be, to be judges. And we also have people from that list that have said that they have been trained or been experienced in being chief judge. So that gives them, those that are chief judges, a list or contest chairs, a, a list to go through for possible uh, candidates for chief judge and judges. And a chief judge gets the judges for the contest. And <clears throat> for an area contest, it's five, minimum of five judges. For a division contest, it's a minimum of seven judges. We also need 
a tie-breaking judge. So that really is, now you need to look for six for the area and eight for the division. But you really need more because you have cancellations. <laughs> there will be people that have things that come up personally, professionally, illnesses and so forth. So you need to have a couple of extra that will be there for you when you need them. And it's always good to have a set of judges that you know are very capable of handling the position. Because it's a very challenging position to be chief, to be a judge. Because you need to be an experienced Toastmaster, preferably. One that has seen a number of contests, maybe as a person who has been in the audience, understands what it takes to be a successful contestant. So you, you understand speech craft, development of answers to table topics questions, and so forth. So experience is very important to be a judge. What is the experience re requirement to be a judge? You actually need to have completed at least six speeches in the CC manual to be eligible to be a judge. And you need to also be a member in good standing. So there's a requirement that you know enough about Toastmasters from having completed six CC manual speeches. How, how long is it that you can be a judge after you take the course, this course? You can be a, a judge in the fall contest. Is that it, one time? Or? No, as many times as and you are. You are fall, uh, ten years from now, if I had it before, would I have to retake it? No. Now, we, we, we try to get trained judges, but I have used non-trained judges because I know they're experienced Toastmasters. Or maybe they have been a judge prior, but not been through the formal training. So they've done it on the club level. They've done it at a club level. They've done it before, and they, they understand the ballot and so forth. We want to try to get as many experienced judges. And the tie-breaking judge is needs to be... It's a, it's a very difficult job to be a tie-breaking judge. So if you want to take a look at the ballots that I have before you, there is, for, let's take, for example, the Tall Tales contest. It, likely this fall, it'll be Tall Tales and it'll definitely be evaluation. I did talk to Janet. She wasn't sure yet whether there was going to be Tall Tales or humor, but if we alternate things back and forth, we were a humorous speech contest last fall, so it's likely to be Tall Tales this fall, because it was two years ago we did Tall Tales. For a regular judge's ballot, if there were, for example, three contestants in the contest, the judge would need to put down all three contestants in the order that the judge feels appropriate. For a tie-breaking judge, <laughs> if there are, for example, seven contestants, you need to put all seven down in the order you think is appropriate. If there are seven contestants, a regular judge only still needs to put down three. If there are three contestants, and you put down only two, your ballot is ineligible and disqualified. Mm -hmm. So you must put down um, if there are three contestants, a minimum of three. If there, are, if there are two contestants, you must put down a minimum of two. Otherwise, your ballot is not eligible. Okay. I'm struggling with this tie-breaking judge. Yes. Because if there's five in an area and seven at... But if there, it's the number of contestants. No, no, that's... Yeah. But there still should never be... Oh, never mind. Got you it. don't know how many, yeah. Yeah, depending on how many areas there are in the contest. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just giving you kind of a scenario. If there are 25, okay. you, yeah. you have to do, it, it only gives you 10. This is actually gone, actually that way. You have to be 25. <laughs> if there was 25, the, 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 the chief read. judge will be... Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, however many contestants there are, you're supposed to list every single one. Yeah. And I'm just giving you an example. The other thing that can disqualify your ballot is simply not signing it and printing your name at the bottom. Uh -huh. So one of the things I ask all of my judges to do, first thing, 
Sign, Sign your ballot. Because if you don't, you pick it up. You've spent all of this time coming to the contest. You've listened to everything. You're thinking you're making a difference. But your ballot goes into the trash later on at home. I don't remember signing one of them. <laughs> well, you now learn that you probably never, and you probably never told, you probably never told, and your ballot never counts. So make sure, absolutely two things, that you fill it out completely, and that you sign your name at the bottom. Now, it's a big mystery up at the top, where you have the judging, the grading of the contestants. And I'll get the evaluation and tall tales. And contestants, this is very important for you to look at, because you're probably going to be based on one of these two things. For tall tales, for example, 30% of the, con the content is going to be based on your speech development. For the next three categories, delivery is going to be 55% of the voting weight. And then the last one is language, 15% in terms of the appropriateness of the language. So if you are a contestant, you want to make sure, absolutely, that you get delivery and content. Very important. But you know, if there's a if it's a close placement between in the minds of the judgment, the judge judges. Language can be so important. Um, even though it's only 15%, it can be something that can make or break you. So you want to make sure that you get everything right if you want to win, but you've got to make sure you understand the weighting so that you put more emphasis on delivery than you do on language, for example. For the evaluation contest, Analytical quality is 40%, recommendations 30%, technique 15%, and summation 15%. Very important to know those weightings so as a contestant and as a judge, you know how to score the contestants or to prepare yourself to be a contestant. Now for the International Speech Contest, as I said, you need to have a minimum of six speeches to be eligible. We're not going to be in the international speech contest season. But if you are competing in the evaluation contest or the tall tales contest, there is no requirement in terms of the number of speeches you have completed, which is simply that you are a member in good standing. And of course, one your club contest in the area, for example. There is um, there are two forms that need to be completed prior to the contest by one by the speaker and one by the judge. And there is the eligibility and originality. And it talks about eligibility for the speaker here. And that is, of course, only for the international requirement of six speeches. And then originality. It's very important that in any contest that your originality be at least 75% your content. Your content. And no more than 25% borrowed content. Can you repeat that last one? Yes. No, this is very, very important as a contestant. That no more than 25% of your content can be borrowed. For example, using quotes or maybe being seeing another speech that you liked and you, you maybe take parts of that or a story. You can't take any more than 25% of that. If you take more than 25% and I judge or another contestant sees that you have borrowed content more than 25%, they can wage a protest against you. And based on 
they voted the judges, you could be disqualified. Now there has to be substantial proof that you have borrowed content that's not your own, more than 25%, and it has to be very well uh, documented or presented by either uh, another contestant or a judge. Because if it's just something that somebody feels as though they've heard somewhere, but you can't really put your finger on it, is that enough to disqualify somebody? I wouldn't, my, my guess, I wouldn't think. You really have to say, source it. This was a borrowed from a speech by somebody, I heard it in this contest, it was back last year, the speaker was so-and-so, it was this, if you can talk about that more specifically. But really, the burden of the proof has to be on the accusers. But as a contestant, you have to be prepared that you may be falsely or wrongly accused of. I've seen it happen. I've seen, it, I've seen a contestant actually be falsely or wrongly accused and was not, in my view, um, in, uh, uh, should have been disqualified, was disqualified, as chief judge, <clears throat> you don't have any involvement. You are simply the facilitator for the judges and the contestant to meet and talk and exchange their questions. You just become you have, a mediator at that point? Yes, you're just a mediator at that point, and you're really kind of a detached mediator. I've also seen a case where somebody, and this was not caught, I've seen somebody that was, that borrowed 100% of the house. It was totally a plagiarized speech, 100%. And the person was not caught at area and division. But after the division was questioned about the the content and was disqualified a district. This is in another district. It didn't happen in this district. But if you are suspicious, one of the things that you can do as a judge or another contestant is have a smartphone and start Googling, Googling in keywords. That's how this person was discovered. Uh, Googling in keywords, sentences, and so forth. And it was a tall tales contest, <clears throat> so it was a it was a children's rhyme, children's story, and it was a kind of a manipulated kind of a taking a, a children's story and was written by somebody else, but was kind of off kilter, so it was kind of a humorous tall tales version of a traditional children's rhyme, and this person use that, and it's kind of an obscure thing, but when you start is googling these words in, boom, it just popped up. And uh, so a contestant would need to go to either the chief judge or the contest chair, or a judge would need to go to either of those two positions and lodge the protest before the end of the contest. Because once the winners are announced, the contest is over, even if the person plagiarized the speech. Now, in you know, in in a club, we have given speeches which, if somebody were to analyze them, they might find borrowed content more than twenty-five percent. But that's different than a contest. A contest is very rigid on the on that because. We're talking about a, a higher level of uh, competing, where we want to make sure that our contestants are really creating their own speech and giving their own story. And it's very important, in the, particularly international, because when you if you get to the international, they cross-examine you like you were just broke out of prison. <laughs> <laughs> if, if it's it's, it's only the judge or another contestant that can yes. fight it. Yes. So if somebody in the audience. Yeah heard this, they couldn't protest. I suppose that they could 
tell somebody who could text to the judge. <laughs> who could possibly yeah, but you're tell somebody to know who the yeah. judges are. But the thing is, is if, if if somebody from the audience, how are how are they going to relay to the person who is who it was that they plagiarized and how it was plagiarized and what was the source? So it gets to be very difficult if somebody outside of the contestants or judges pool was the person who informed somebody. Yes, Richard. I'm just making clear that as a contestant, you can't hire a speechwriter. You may yes. make a purchase and purchase those words, but they are still not your original Absolutely. Content. There are people who are, this is an extremely good point, there are people who are ambitious to be, particularly in international, they're so ambitious to be the winner of an international speech contest that they hire a coach or a speechwriter. That is not original content. It's got to be your story, not somebody else's story about you. It's got to be your story. Can you hire a coach for, to coach on delivery? Absolutely. And even content. Huh? And even content. Uh -huh. But the content that the coach gives you cannot be more than 25%. So if your coach rewrites your speech for you, it can't be any more than 25% of that. You have to rewrite yeah. it again. <laughs> and that's a, a, another thing that the, at the international level, before you even go on the stage, they are checking your speech contest. This is the international. When, when all of us go there in, in Las Vegas in August, the, the vetting process is amazing. They will ask you about your past. Did this happen? For example, the speech two years ago was changed by a tire. The, the person was told about how he was asked, did he really have a flat tire? Was it really in front of this gas station? Did the person he speak to really was the owner of the gas station? Did it happen as he said? And it was the winning speech, of course. But you're asked if this is really your story. So it's very important that it be your story. Now, it had been written by a a coach or a speechwriter, it wouldn't have been, so he would have been disqualified. Can your coach make suggestions, and it's your words, you, you've made, taken the coach's suggestions and, and put yeah. it in your own words, and then yeah. it doesn't count as that 25%, right. correct? Right, because you're if you were to take somebody a, su a suggestion, you know, you need to really work on the ending of the speech. You need to give a more powerful call to action or something like that. And you might want to reference something that you reference earlier in your right. speech. That not but if they, start, if they start writing out the words okay. and saying this speech needs to be have this sentence in it, you start the coach writes out the sentence, then that's not original content anymore. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, in table topics you can make things up, you can yes. go and fly. When you're doing an original speech at this level, it actually has to be a true story, or is that the recommendation based on? For tall, for, like for tall, uh, for, for table topics. Yeah, I know for table topics. You like can international. For, for, for international. For international, it's supposed to be your a, story. It's supposed to be your story, and it's supposed to be a true story. Okay. It's not supposed to be a fabricated story. So, it, it, it really should use something that was part of your life. It, it could be part of somebody else's life, but it's had an impact on you. But it, it can't. It can't be a, a fabricated story. Yeah. It really should be a true story. I, I had a speech I had to give where I had to change the ending because my mentor suggested it was a little too dark the way that it was. And because uh, a baby died. <laughs> yeah. And so he suggested that it was a little too uncomfortable for, for people. So um, I, I, I changed it the very end of it so that uh, there was a different outcome for the child and the mother of the child. It didn't feel authentic to me to do it that way, but I did it based upon its recommendation. Right. And I have two versions of it, and I look back on it, it feels like, you know, kind of wish I'd gone with what was real, mm -hmm. but um, in a situation like that, you just basically, if you're competing at that level, this is what you want to do. You just, this is your story, that's how it is. Mm -hmm. Don't. Okay. Please. Yeah. Thank you. And um, so let's see, what, what is our time right now? Okay. Uh, what I want to talk about now is, from the ju judge's perspective, in terms of 
what you need to be in order to be a, a really fair judge. And you have to be absolutely fair, impartial, and you have to be professional in your position as a being a judge. Because it reflects not only on the contest, but the entire organization of Toastmasters International. And it's unfair to the contestants who have worked so hard if you are biased. So you must be fair and impartial. And if you do not feel as though you can be fair, fair and impartial, then it would be in the best interest of the contest to recuse yourself from that. And we'll find a different judge. The attributes of a good judge. Perceptive. You listen carefully and attentively. Lack of attention can lead your misperceiving the content of the speech. You're daydreaming, leading to a poor decision. Competent. You are familiar with the contest rules. I send out to every judge and every contestant as chief judge a copy of the contest rules. So they got it. I send it as a PDF about two weeks before they got it. Got it? Can read through it. You are familiar with the judge's form. This. I also send this out prior to the contest to both the contestants and to the judges. So that you can familiarize yourself with the form. That you are impartial and avoid following, allowing friendships, affiliation, age, sex, race, creed, national origin, profession, or disapproval of a speech topic to improperly sway your decision. Very important. Trustworthy. You are mindful of the trusted place you are in by the contestant, contest officials, contestants, and audience members, and Toastmasters everywhere to select the best winner, the best speaker as winner. And that is the ultimate goal of the judge, is to pick a winner. And while you tally up the scores here, at the end, this is only a guy. If your heart tells you that the first place person is different than you have graded here, then you put the first place as you believe is correct, second place as you believe is correct. The job is to pick a winner, not just to take this and move this down here. You can use that as your guide, and maybe that is 100% the way you will do that. But it is not that you have to do that. The job is to pick a winner, and that is the only goal that you have. There are people that are well-known speakers, that have competed before, that have won before. Just because they have done that does not mean that they are the best speaker of that day. And you must be mindful as a judge that you must pick the best speaker with the best speech that day. No matter if they've won every single year, table topics, it doesn't matter. Don't be swayed by that. Also don't be swayed by somebody who has never won. And you feel as though, well, it's an opportunity now for this person to get a chance because I really feel this <laughs> <laughs> You know, he's competed for 22 years and he's never won. Don't, don't be swayed by that either. You've got to be true to your, your ethics. Or somebody that's been there so many times, familiarity breeds contempt, right? I've seen that person so many times. I'm not going to vote for them. Don't let that enter into your thinking either. Make sure you're familiar with the judge's form. Some common misperceptions. It is not correct to use humor in the international speech contest. Actually, if you look at the international speech contest winners over the past six, seven, eight years, going back to Lance Miller and so forth, humor has been a very important part of their speeches. In fact, if you look at it, about one laugh per minute has been a the rate. That's not that it has to be, but that's what's been the case. There's also a, a perception that an international speech contest has to be ins inspirational. It doesn't. It, ha it can be about anything. It can be about your dog. 
There is no guidelines to it. There is, however, something, a formula that seems to win. And as a contestant, you might want to look at what has been successful over the past seven or eight years. But there is absolutely nothing that says that it has to be an inspirational or motivational speech. It could be about anything. It could be a totally humorous speech. It could be a tall tale. It could be anything. You said it had to be true. It has to be true. Well, yeah, it, it can be a tall tale, but yes. A speech. A speech yeah, sometimes life is a tall tale. Yeah, yeah well, yes, if, you're, if your life is a tall tale. Yeah, and my next line is a speech in the International Speech Contest should be inspirational or motivational. Actually, any type of speech may be given. The speaker disqualified himself by going overtime. As a contest judge, you are not to enforce any time on the speech. That is the job of the timer, the judge. Judge the spe speech without reference to the clock. So don't you know, check your own watch. Don't look at the timing device. Pick the winner based on what you think is the winner. Because the timing device may be possibly off, whatever. Don't worry about that. Worry about watching speech. The other thing is, I just want to check my time, I've got a few minutes left, is that you must break your own ties on this form. I have seen, and this will just qualify the ballot, I have seen people come and say, first place, Gordon Murley, and second place, also Dan Hagen. You know, two, two people listed in spot number one, or uh, number two. The ballot's disqualified, because how do I know now who is the second uh, place winner? And I, have, I can't give a, a scoring, proper scoring. So I have to take that and discard it. I've seen that, even from experienced judges who forget that point. You must break your own tie. Only one person per line. Then, then when you're finished with the ballot, make sure that you keep this top portion, tear off the bottom portion, and give only the bottom portion to the ballot collector. Take the top portion home, home, away from the contest site, destroy it. Put it into, not in recycling, who knows? <laughs> put it, destroy it, put it in the incinerator. <laughs> Never to be seen again. Because we're, we usually have two hours to do this, but I'm trying to do it in one hour. I wanted to know if there are any questions, because we really are only about two or three minutes left in my presentation. Yes, Richard. In your handout, District 52 Contest Chief Judge, page 2. Yes. <laughs> bottom, of the, bottom of the page, there's this very bold par a paragraph. This, yes. Right? But I don't really understand it. A member serving as a chief judge, voting judge, or tie-breaking judge beyond the club level for a contest in which the member is still competing or intends to compete. What? Is, is not eligible? Is not? Cannot? You know, it's like, it feels like there's something missing here. What's it? Well, it's right out of uh, the rule book. A member serving as chief judge, voting judge, or typing judge beyond the club level for a contest in which the club as a member is still meet. Um, Something's missing. Yeah. It, I, I, think, I think he's right. Part of the I, it seems like something's missing. <laughs> what is, it's saying is that uh, you, can't, you can't be a contestant and be a judge, a voting judge, a tie-breaking judge, beyond the club con level for any con for a contest in which the member is competing or intends to compete. So any anywhere. So let's say you're you're wanting to be a, a judge here in District 52, but you're competing in District One. You can't do it. That's what the intention of that. I'll check the wording out from the. Rule book. Okay. That's what that's yeah. what I thought was the meaning. Is. Yeah, you can't, you can't be a judge and a contestant. Period. Even if yes. other than the club, level. even if it's a different contest in a different district, anyway. Or a judge in a con contest which a member of your group is participating in. Right. Yes. Right. There's there's a. I'll just say one thing. Last thing. There's a very important point. 
at the area level, you can be a member of a, at the area level. You can be a member of you can be a judge, a chief judge of a of a of an area contest in which a club member of yours is in that contest. So you can judge a fellow contest, a fellow club Two member judge. at the area level. Once you get to the division and district, you cannot be a member of any club in which that contestant is a member, if you are judging or chief judge. Even if they're not competing for the club in which uh, you're, you're, you're the home club. So let, let's say you're a member of three clubs, and you may not, you may not even know this, but you may there may be a club in which you, you're a member of three clubs, he's a member of three, three clubs, and this person has never come, gone to a meeting. Never gone to a meeting. But is a member, a co-member of, uh, of you and another club. That's right. Oh, wow. Okay, wow, he's right. So you don't even know you're breaking the you rules. You might not even know you're breaking the rules. It's hard. Yeah. And so, we, I, have, I had judges come up to me uh, literally a day before and they say, I just found out that a member of my club is competing in another club in this contest, so I am disqualified from this contest because I never, I've never seen him in the club meeting. He had never attended. And yes. I ran into something last time. I had volunteered to be a judge here in District 52. I belong to another club in over in um, Area 1. Yes. A contestant from 52 came to our club over there to practice his speech. Yes. So I had to disqualify myself because he would be competing here. Yes, uh, well, you were you just qualified. I remember that you you, you felt uncomfortable because you had not only listened to the speech, but I had helped him with things correct. You oh, speech, okay. so yes. I had worked with him. After the, after the, involved. so I came was personally involved. To the, came to the club, did a practice speech. It was not a contest, but it was a practice speech, and you had talked to the contestant afterward. And but it was a speech he planned on giving. It was planned speech, and so you felt like you were at. Uh, Disqualify yourself yeah. because you were now no longer could be fair and impartial. Right. And that I remember when you did that. I remember part. when you did that, and I appreciated that. That's that is the kind of people we need to be <laughs> judges. Even though you weren't a judge, you were a person who said, "I have a boundary and I have an ethics," and, and I felt as though I was uncomfortable. Thank you, and thank you very much.